Well, hello. This video is meant to go along with the second edition of Forensic and Analytics, written by yours truly, and we're going to be talking about Benford's Law. So, we have quite a lot of ground to cover. Uh, we're going to do some theory, and then we're actually going to go in and analyze some data using uh, the Excel template, and uh, all the files that we're going to be using today uh, are available to you. Now, Frank Benford was a physicist at the GE Research Laboratories in Schenectady, New York, and he noticed that the first few pages of his log table books were more worn than the last few pages. This led him to believe that maybe there are more numbers in the world with low first digits than with high first digits. Set out on a crusade, 20 lists of numbers, 20,229 observations, and these uh, numbers were from various sources, and he counted how many of the numbers had a first digit 1, first digit 2, and the like. Well, the year is 2020, so in this case, the first digit is a 2, the second digit is a 0, and that's basically where we get the first and second digits from. So, diverse data, he found that 30.6% of the numbers started with a 1, 18.5% of the numbers started with the digit 2. He then made some assumptions as to how numbers worked, and the underlying assumption here was that if I rank my numbers from smallest to largest, I'm going to get this thing called a geometric sequence. I'm sure you remember it from high school. He then did some integral calculus. Maybe you don't remember that from high school. And came up with what we've grown to love and adore and call Benford's Law. And under Benford's Law, I expect 30.1% of the numbers, the first position to be a 1. I expect 17.6% of my numbers to start with a 2, and the poor old 9 only expected as a first digit about 4.5% of the time. In the second place, 0 is expected as a second digit about 12% of the time, and the 9 only 8.5% of the time. What we see here is there's a large, there's always a bias towards the low digits, and it is largest for in the first position. Once we get to the fourth position, the digits are, for all practical purposes, even Stephen. Now, I came across Benford's Law when I was a PhD student, and this was my textbook. See, I didn't sell my textbooks back. And right at the top here on page 86, the author says that if you expect the digits in tabulated data to be uh, occur evenly, he said this is an improper prior. And he said we actually have an expectation for the digits, and it is this formula over here, and he doesn't call it Benford's Law, but this is indeed Benford's Law. I also saw this, published in 1988, and here the author was looking at uh, to see whether companies round up their uh, uh, net income numbers when they are just below any sort of threshold, and he talks about, in this case, Feller developed a proof. I don't know whether he was a jolly good Feller, but anyway, he was a Feller, and they talked about Feller's proof, and he actually also doesn't use uh, the word Benford's Law. Now, why would Benford's Law actually be true? Let's do the intuitive explanation and save the calculus for another day. If we think of the Dow Jones at 1,000 points, the Dow Jones has to double from 1,000 to 2,000 before I get a new first digit called 2. When the Dow's at 5,000, well, then I only need a 20% increase before I get a new first digit, 6. And at 9,000, I only need an 11% increase before I get this new first digit, 1 again. And then when I'm at 10,000, uh, 10, I in fact have to double. So watch this. 100 in 1906, 500 50 years later. Uh, here we go, 1,000 to 2,000, all these would have a first digit 1 from 1972 to 1987, 15, 16 years. You can see this was a wonderful period here, just clicking up the thousands as fast as can be. And then we got to 10,000 in 1999. It took us 18 years, I think, to get to 20,000, which is what we see in the last row over there. Now, I need my data to represent size. Not all numbers represent size. Telephone numbers have nothing to do with size. No built-in maximum or minimum, except the minimum of zero is okay. 
No, numbers used as labels, and we love uh, to use numbers as labels. For example, we have highway numbers, bank account numbers, uh, product numbers, and the like. Overlaying all this, there needs to either be some geometric growth pattern, such as uh, populations or uh, companies having larger and larger sales numbers. There needs to be either some geometric growth pattern underlying these numbers, or these numbers need to be random samples from random distributions. And the bottom, an example of the bottom one could be journal entries. It's pretty much lots of different distributions and lots of different random samples uh, making their play there. Now, let's have a look at some real data. This is incorporated places, and not everybody in America lives in a town or city, but indeed about 200 million people do, and there are about 19 and a half thousand towns and cities. This is just one page. This is not all our cities. We have a bit more than this. So here we have, uh, call it 20-something uh, numbers, uh, a town and city, and we have the populations. And if I actually take the population numbers for all 19 and a half thousand cities, I get this beautiful graph over here. The way we read the graph is this is the first digit 1, this is the first digit 9, these are the Benford proportions, 30.1, 17.6, 12.5, all the way down to around 4.5%. Uh, these are the Benford expectations here. These are the actual proportions. And when the actual proportion is right over there, it means the actual is pretty much equal to the expected. And all in all, that's a pretty good fit. So first digits, 1 to 9. This is Benford and the bars show the actual proportion. First two digits. The first two digits go from 10 to 99, and this is quite amazing. We expect about 4.1% of all numbers to start with a one zero, and less than half a percent to start with a double nine. There's a steep drop off over there, but the town and city population data follows Benford's law reasonably nicely. These are the last two digits. And in the last two digits, I expect those last two digits, which can go from 00 to 99, to be evenly distributed. And lo and behold, they are evenly distributed um, for these towns and cities. So the ending digits are as likely to be 13 as they are to be 92. This is some data from the New York Stock Exchange. This is um, corporate data uh, volumes. Uh, stock volumes for the companies for the entire year of 1995. This is a very old graph, and indeed these stock volumes follow Benford's law very nicely. This is accounts payable invoice numbers from a city in the Carolinas. Uh, these are the dollar amounts that were paid, and indeed first digits, beautifully Benford, and in general accounting data follows Benford's law very nicely. These are the first two digits of the payments made by the city in the Carolinas, about 250,000 records. Some spikes over years, a little bit messy, but generally nice and Benford, at least for payments data. Mathematical geology, Benford's law applied to hydrology data. And what I did here with Stephen Miller, we looked at stream flow statistics, 450,000 records, about 100 years worth of data. This is the Benford line. These are the stream flow numbers. Beautifully Benford. I also looked at accounting data. And this is going way back 2005, 2006 data. And this was from the uh, Capital IQ database. And I just looked at various numbers that companies report, sort of a hodgepodge of numbers. For 2005, the first digits of those accounting numbers, beautifully Benford. For 2006, Beautifully Benford. For 2006, the first two digits, again, beautifully Benford. These are the ledger balances. This company had about 80,000 ledger accounts. Um, so here we go. These are the first two digits of the balances. Beautifully Benford. Um, this fraud scheme is discussed in Chapter 5 of my book. And what I looked at, I looked at the first two digits of the journal entries, the amounts credited by the employees in an electric utility to their customers. Right over here, we see a spike at double nine, lots more numbers beginning with double nine. When I went to look at the actual numbers, these were fraudulent journal entries. These customers were getting 
credits that they didn't deserve, the credits reduced the amounts payable, and uh, of course there was some kickback between the employees and the customers. This is a good journal article, and in here I talk about when Benford's Law might work well. I'm quoting an article, I will give you the reference to the article, but this is the Health South fraud, and the chief financial officer that started the fraud off talked about lots of journal entries, and the journal entries were kept below 5,000 to avoid detection by the auditors. At the end of this exercise, 126,000 fraudulent journal entries were posted quarterly. So what I did, and this is figure 3.5 in my book, uh, this is a journal entry database. And what I did was I then added about 10% of the numbers going from, um, I can't remember, was it two, from 2000 to 4,999. So I added a whole lot of fictitious journal entries. And look, I sort of get a little mountain range over there. Then I add more, and then I add more. Benford's Law would have worked well in detecting this fraud. The other thing was that what the company did was they had cash accounts, bank accounts, and they simply made up the cash balances. They overstated their cash by $370 million right over here. The company overstated its cash by approximately $370 million. When I go and I look at the balance sheet of that company, they reported $389 million in cash, and this was quite amazing. This tells me that the, oh, they only had $19 million, and they overstated it by $370 million. And if we go back, if we analyze the digit patterns of these 2,600 bank accounts, because most of them were fake, I think Benford's Law would have picked up this fraud. This is uh, myself and Weston Smith. This was about three years ago in Minneapolis. Be careful, though. This was an analysis of customer checking accounts, and what I looked at was I looked at the checks that people write. So checks from our checking accounts, and I saw a horrible pattern here, all these spikes, it doesn't look all that Benford, and it turned out that lots of people write round number checks, I presume, when they go and cash checks. So be careful. When you see these spikes, it might be a feature of the data as opposed to fraud. This was a nice, uh, interesting paper that I published as well, the Journal of Forensic Accounting Research, and I will give you the reference to that at the bottom. And what I did was I looked at the numbers used in accounting textbooks. And of course, the owners are inventing the numbers, so it was rather strange. The first digits of the numbers that the authors invented in their accounting textbooks followed Benford's Law very nicely. Some of them close to being perfect. Then I looked at the actual numbers and I saw lots of round numbers and we know that those authors do like round numbers. I went to the early textbooks, the 1970s, the 1980s, and I saw first digits pretty good. And here's the rub. The first digits might look pretty good, but the first digit is a rather blunt test. It is only when I go and look at the first two digits that I can see these huge spikes here that are the direct result of these round numbers. So I don't like the first digit test. It hides lots of, hmm, funny business. I like the first two digit test. That usually tells me the story that I need. This was sent to me by a student that watched the presentation in Buffalo, New York. And he said, look at these elevator buttons. There we go. The one is more worn than all the other buttons. That must be a result of Benford's Law. I thought it was very nice that he sent me the photo, but of course this has nothing to do with Benford's Law. It's more a function of everybody that goes down goes down to the first floor, uh, which is why that button gets pressed more often than not. Another student sent me this from a gas pump, and we can see the low digits being used far more than the high digits. Again, this really has nothing to do with Benford's Law. It's in fact what you need to do when you need to press these numbers. Maybe you need to enter the zip code or a one if you want a car wash or things like that. Again, not all that Benford. So, Benford works well. Over here is more a case with income tax returns. Everybody has the same incentive to sort of manipulate in sort of the same way. 
First step, other tests. Let's go and have a look at our data here. So this is my Negrini cycle template. And what I have here is this is where we always have to put our dollar amounts. We can go right to the bottom if we like. I have put in numbers here, you know, simply to have something there so that the um, spreadsheet doesn't try to divide by zero and we get error messages out the wazoo over there. So here I am in the data tab. I'm going to my data and I'm looking at the District of Columbia's purchasing car data. This is six years worth of data. I'm going to the amount column and I'm simply going to go copy. paste. Now I have my real data over here. And now I need to copy these formulas to the bottom, otherwise uh, I'm just going to get nothing here and Excel is not going to know what to do. I can copy this a few ways. I can use this, copy and F5. Um, or I can go here, I can get the plus sign and a swift left a double click. That's amazing formulas were all copied down to the bottom. If I want to go check, I can do home and home. Yes, indeed. This is my last row. All the formulas were copied down to the bottom. I'm going to do control home and I'm back up top here. Now, this spreadsheet is meant to only analyze numbers that are $10 and higher. Here's a comment which tells you what to do if you want to analyze numbers that are also less than 10. The last two digits, you know, there's no real such thing as the last two digits of a number, but I have tens and units here and the cents over here. This is a comment box which tells you what's happening in these two columns, because if you are going to do the last two digit test, you do need to know what this thing is calculating. And if you don't like what it's calculating, you know, you can go in and change the formula if you like. This is just an overall comment, and this sort of explains what's happening here. Uh, you should be good after reading that. Um, <clears throat> and I have a few comments over there too. But generally, after I copied the formula down, believe it or not, everything's been done. If I go on there and click first digits, there's my first digit graph. Second digits, my second digit graph. First two digits, there's my first two digit graph. And if I go to my book, um, here we go. This is chapter four. This is figure 4.6. This is, this graph is discussed in detail over here and we just got it over here. So you should be able to mimic the book exactly. This is the last two digits, assuming that the cents were going to be the last two digits. And this is quite amazing. We can see here about 38% of the numbers ended with double O. This is if I wanted the tens and the units. And the summation test here is looking for large numbers. And guess what this is telling me? It says I have lots of large numbers with first two digits two, four. I have lots of large numbers with first two digits double nine. And if I go to the book, chapter six. It talks about the summation test and that should make it clear <clears throat> what the book is doing over there at least what the program is doing over here. Now, so last two digit graph, summation, it's telling me I have those big numbers. And in the book, I show you what those big numbers are. My beautiful first two digits and first two digits. This is the data profile, all nice and neatly done for me. You just got it on a plate. And the data profile is uh, talked about in chapter two of the book. This is figure 2.3 the data profile. It's a high level overview test. Um, it gets discussed over here. And this was how easy it was to do it. And um, the numbers are done there for you. These are my tables. So this is some heavy lifting over here. This is my table for the first digits. And here we go. The first digit one, it counted. 55,893 first digit ones. And it got that from here. There are first digit ones. It just counted how many 
they are. This is the actual proportion, which is the count divided by the number of records. This is the Benford proportion, which is the Benford's law formula. This is the difference between these two. This is the absolute, meaning I just look at the uh, positive value of whatever the difference is. And here is my mean absolute deviation, 008. And now, what I can do is I can go 00853. Let me get back to PowerPoint quickly. Don't want to make you dizzy. But this was is my slide. This is table 4.2 in the book. It's saying, first digits, if the first digits are in this range, it is acceptable conformity, and that's where I was, 008. These are the second digits. The second digits go from 0 to 9. <clears throat> These are my first two digits. Oh, I forgot to tell you what the Z statistic is all about, or the Z statistic. There it is. When the Z statistic is larger than 1.96, the difference is statistically significant at the 0.05 level. Um, I'm just trying to remember where it is in my book. I think it is here in Chapter 5. And I should know better uh, than just to click. Here it is. It's in Chapter Four, I talk about the Z statistic, when it's big, when it's statistically significant, and what all that means. Or you can just go on the internet and look up uh, st statistical significance and the Z statistic. You can see that when the data set is large, most of these differences are statistically significant. Here we go again. First two digits, the mean absolute deviation down there, 0022. If I go to my table, oops, I've lost it. There it is. First two digits, 0022, and I think I just cross it. I think I'm, uh, am I larger or smaller? I forget. I'm right on the cusp over there. So I either just get this or I get that. Between margin will be acceptable and non-conformity. Let's go look at that graph again. See, not that pretty. It is actually somewhere between marginally acceptable and non-conformity. Back to the tables. This talks about the summation test calculations that get done. There's the summation test. You can't see the total. It's the total of all the numbers in the um, database. The last two digits, these are the two uh, totals over there. And I don't think I have mean absolute deviations over there. So. We have the table, everything you ever wanted to know about the first digit, but we're afraid to ask. The second digits, the first two digits, these are the ones that we would care about most. This is a summation test is going to tell me if I have some really high values lurking. The data profile is pretty much a freebie for you, calculated free of charge. My graphs, first digits, the Benford line, the actual proportions, Second, first two, the summation, they are high values beginning with two, four, and double nine. The last two digits, this is a nice test for invented numbers, and this should work well for trying to detect uh, estimates and invented numbers. This is my data. In these columns, you can pretty much put whatever you like. It's uh, something extra. Do read the comments. You know, there's not that much to read. Be sure to remember to copy the formulas all the way down. And first two digits, there we go. And I hope you liked that uh, short introduction. So I'm just going to go back again. Sorry, don't mean to make you dizzy. There we go. A nice test. One person does all the inventing. They will fall into a rut and they'll start to invent the same types of numbers. Watch all you saw all those uh, double nines up there. Lots of different people all have the same incentive to go in the same direction, maybe to avoid currency transaction reports. Everybody's keeping their cash deposits under 10,000. This means Benford Law will pick this up because we'll have lots of extra double nine or double uh, nine eight or nine seven as the first two digits. By itself, not going to do all that much. A nice first step. And if I go back to my book with a little um, plug over here, these are the tests that usually follow the Benford's Law test. 
and you can see the first one here is the number duplication test. It's a first step, it's a great first step, but it can't be the only thing you do. If the only thing you do is a first two-digit graph, you really haven't done all that much, and uh, you don't deserve to find any anomalies from such a quick look. So, it's a first step. Completing the cycle, I talk about the other steps here, and I talk about chapter uh, in chapter six, I talk about more advanced tests. Uh, that's the important table, but you can just take a screenshot of this. I don't mind. So, on that note, from me to you, bye-bye. Hope you enjoyed it.